Good morning. Just waiting for things to um, get out there for people to know that we're live. Um, how I'm going to run things today, just so you know, is I'm going to run, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an interview with um, Kristen Bianchini, who was working on loons in Canada, and then we'll have a break. Um, and then I think I'll do the bird feeder in uh, in the US. So that will be the uh, uh, that will be the way it uh, way it goes. So we'll just we'll just let um, oh I better fix the um, banner, hadn't I? Still a couple of minutes until uh, until we would really be ready to go, but I think we might. We might just get this get this going. Let's put this on full screen. Here we are. Hello, bird nerds. Hello, bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams, and today, today, I am a loony. That's right, today, I'm a loony. And of course, anyone who's ever watched a Netflix series set in the Arctic wilderness where a bunch of terrible, awful things befall people Across, uh, uh, around a uh, secluded lake will know that that was the call of a loon. And to talk loons with me is, I'm going to glorify, uh, glorify the title here, loon expert, <laughs> Dr. Christian Bianchini, who is a wildlife biologist with... Environment Canada, I think that's the right terminology. Hi, Kristen. Welcome Hi. to the Bird Emergency. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Now, we've been, we've been trying to have a chat for quite a long time because I saw your um, tweets about your loon work um, and you had that problem that so many of the people that I've spoken to in the last couple of years have had doing field work during COVID. So tell us about the work that you did with loons and then we'll spin off and talk about what loons are. Sure. Um, yeah, so I had a postdoctoral position uh, with Birds Canada and Acadia University. And so I guess I had two projects that I was working on. Uh, the first project was looking at loons and how they've been affected by acid rain around Sudbury, which is this city in Canada where there was super high acid rain production in the 80s. Um, and then it kind of, there were a bunch of uh, regulations that were put into place and the acid rain um, was really curtailed there. And then, um, so my job was to go back um, 
sorry. There's there's like a lot of feedback in my earphone. Is there? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, well, that uh, I think that means that the um, headphones are going to have to come back out. Okay. Hold on just a minute. Just hold on. Is that taken care of it? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm not hearing an echo. Oh, yeah, you I'll, know, it's still there a bit. I'll just go back in and change this. Okay, how about now? Uh, let's see. Oh, no, that's perfect. No, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, see, that's why I use, that's why I use the headphones. I'm really <laughs> going to have to. I'm going to have to lash out and do some in-ear mon in monitors. Um, that means I have to do the introduction again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. All right. Let's um, uh, let me do a, a clap so I'll be able to find it in the um, in the edit easily. And we go back to here. Go back to here. Put the loon the loon back on <laughs> and all right let me uh let me go hello bird nerds i'm grant williams this is the bird emergency the show where i get to speak to people who have been doing amazing work with all kinds of birds uh rare threatened endangered birds and sometimes birds that are tipping that way Today, I have a treat for you. Just imagine that you're at home. You've just clicked on Netflix or Apple TV or whatever and, and the recommended for you. The scene is a deserted lake in the Arctic wilderness. Oh, I didn't even hear what I was wanting to hear. Let me... Who's who's crashing around at your place, Chris? I'm sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> I gave her a bone. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now I'm I'm going to do that that bit again. So the recommended Netflix show has got an opening screen around a deserted lake in the Arctic wilderness. Yes, people, you know what we're talking about. That is the common loon. The common loon, that overused sound effect in every TV series. I'm talking to an expert in loons today, Dr. Kristen Bianchini, who is a wildlife ecologist with Environment Canada. Hi, Kristen. Welcome to the bird emergency. Hi, thanks for having me. Now we we're in a bit of a silly mood because we've had a couple of a couple of goes because I got something wrong and then Kristen's dog is is running around her feet enjoying a new beautiful big bone, which often means that dogs make doggy bone noises. But hopefully hopefully we don't get too much of it into the rest of the show. Uh, Kristen, thanks for joining me. Uh, you've been working on loons since. 2018, 2019? 2018, yeah. And what was what was the Loon Project uh, wanting to discover? Let's set it up and then we'll talk about why loons are pretty amazing. Sure, yeah. So I had two projects I was working on. Um, one was analyzing 40 years of citizen science data. So people across Canada um, were collecting data on how many chicks loons were producing. And so it was seeing how loons have been doing over time in terms of their chick production, and then looking at different drivers of what could be affecting changes over time. And then the second project was looking at acid rain and studying an area in Canada where there was a lot of acid rain in the past, but now it's improved. And so I was just looking to see at whether the number of chicks that loons have been producing has improved along with those improvements in acid rain. Okay. 
I really want to dig into that 40 years of citizen science status because mm -hmm. um, citizen science is amazing, as we all know, especially when it comes to getting people involved in um, learning about their birds and loving their birds. Now, loons have a really interesting sort of history in terms of how they've been classified. So loons, and the, the, the genus name for loons was originally applied to a whole bunch of sea ducks. Did you know that? I didn't know that, no. No, so, um, so Garvia is how I would pronounce it, is the loons. And what have we got? I think there's half a dozen odd species. Um, let me let me let me have a look. I should have remembered one, two, three, four, five, five recognised species mm -hmm. uh, at the moment of loons, and the call that we heard is the common loon, which is found sort of right around the Arctic Circle. Um, but loons are, are mostly an American species, but they were initially lumped in with mergansers and and related uh, sea ducks. But then they were split out on their own. And they've got this great name that everyone thinks is derived from the English usage of the term loon, which is for lunatic and people who are crazy and thought to perhaps derive from the, from the vocalisations or how clumsy they are on land because they're a bit, uh, they're, they're, they're back-ended the, the legs are very far back and they're a heavy bird for their for their size. But from my research, neither of those derivations are, are correct. Do you know what the... I'm really putting on the spot here. But do, <laughs> do, do, do you know what the um, most likely uh, derivation of the, of the word loon is? Oh, I know I've learned about this at some time, but it's escaping me, so you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> Uh, the Norse or the Norwegian Norwegian mm -hmm. word for loon is roughly the same as how we pronounce loon. Uh, let me just get the right uh, uh, the right one. Gee, it's my, miles down my my research here. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Um, loon. L-U-R-N, loon, I think. It's either loon or loom. Um, so there we are. Someone someone who's an entomologist or whatnot will probably pick me up and tell me I'm wrong. But that seems to be where where it's come from as the, uh, as the Vikings came into um, other parts of Europe. That word has been attached to that, uh, to that bird. So there we are. All right. How did you go, Kristen, with studying the loon in the time of COVID? Oh, your dog loves his bone. Too, yeah, right? she's really <laughs> upset right now. <laughs> um, How, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, t please don't tell me you took the bone away from, from the dog. Uh, she's just, she hates being alone. She just wants my attention. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, there, there we go. What's her name so that everyone can uh, can know uh, who, who the, who's joining in? Well, our other uh, co-star here is Coda. <laughs> she's oh. a four-year-old uh, German Shepherd cattle dog mix. <laughs> oh, good on you, Coda. Well, yeah. don't, don't feel lonely. Kristen's still still there. So let's get back, let's get back to, <laughs> to the important uh, matter of, doing field work in a time of a global pandemic. Uh, set, set us up. You said there was a lot of data there for you to analyse, but what field work were you, were you planning to do and what did you get completed? Well, luckily, most of my field work took place in 2019, the year before the pandemic. Um, and so the fieldwork that I was doing was going up to uh, 94 lakes around Sudbury, Ontario in Canada. And so I was looking at, um, I was looking for loons and then I was taking water samples to measure different kind of water chemistry parameters to see 
um, weather lakes were acidic and different kind of indications of whether they'd improved chemically over time. So it was a lot of backcountry camping, which was really fun, and canoeing from lake to lake, driving on logging roads, which was pretty exciting, and, uh, and yeah, dealing with a lot of black flies and mosquitoes. Excuse me. So, um, was most of it working on your own? I had a field assistant. So it was me and uh, my field assistant who were up there for two months um, in May. So that's the height of black fly season in Ontario. So it was pretty intense. And then we went back in September. So we were there in May to find out which lakes had loons and which loons had chicks. And then we went back later to see if or how many chicks were over six weeks old? Because once when chicks reach about six weeks of age, um, they're more likely to survive and become adults. So it's a good measure of reproductive success in loons. How many species of loon are there in Canada? And were you only looking, like had you restricted your research just to the common loon? Yes, yeah, so there are five species of loons in Canada. Um, we were just looking at common loons because those are the ones that are found um, in Ontario. So that's where I was doing all of my research. Um, the other loons are, there are other loons in Ontario, but they're much farther north, kind of more in the Arctic region. Okay. And it, is the, the common loon a sort of common run of the mill uh, bird when, if people are out at, at a, a lake, I mean, I'll just, say what happens if you're here in in southern Australia, you're likely to see some black swans, Pacific black ducks, grey teal, moorhen, coot, swamp hens, maybe some pelicans. Uh, but that's what you're likely to see swimming around on your local lake. Um, what What's the case if you head out to, obviously it's colder, but an hour's drive out of um, uh, out of out of the big city. What what are we talking? I I know that Wims is in Ontario. That's about <laughs> the only. <laughs> um, what what are you? Are people likely to see a, a common loon? Are they are they a normal bird? Yeah, um, if you get into the boreal, so that's kind of northern areas where there are lots of like pine, spruce trees, and lakes. Um, there are lots of loons. Their uh, their their name's pretty appropriate. They're pretty common, but I would say that they're even though they're pretty common, they're a really cherished species here. Like they're everyone gets pretty excited when they see a loon, even though they're like pretty common. And do you think that has a bit to do with with the fact that? the call is just used so often to set up spookiness or remoteness in all sorts of uh, TV shows, movies, you know, audio books, all sorts of things. The, the, loon, the loon sets up loneliness, remoteness, foreboding. There's a whole lot of ways that call is used. Is that why Canada loves the loon? I think, yeah, it has something to do with that. I think it's because for us, like, it's associated with going camping and being outside. They're real symbol of the wilderness here. So I think everyone has really fond memories that they're out um, kind of enjoying summer on a lake, then that's where the loons are. So I think it's just got really, really nice associations for us of summer and being outside. Ripper. Um, <laughs> the, it, is the, the conservation status of the loon uh, stable? Like, is it, it, are the populations decreasing? And is that why your work was, was needed? Or is, is there just no concerns whatsoever for the loon? Uh, well, for the common loon, they're doing pretty well in Canada. It really depends regionally on where you're talking. Um, and cause they're also found in the Northern states in the U S and they've been extirpated from some states. They're starting to do a bit better depending on where you're talking about. But in Canada, loons are doing pretty well. And the reason that I was looking at them was more so that preliminary work had shown that they were producing fewer chicks over time. And so we were looking at their reproductive success to see um, what if something could be going on there. What 
what did you learn? Uh, my my preliminary research tells me that loons have a, an average clutch size of two, but that it may be uh, one. So what did your results tell you about clutch size? And did you find out anything about um, brood success? Yeah, so unfortunately we found that um, in Ontario and especially in regions like Sudbury where there was a lot of acid rain in the past, loons are producing fewer and fewer chicks over time. So there, we're not seeing changes in adult numbers because loons are really long lived. They'll live to be about 30 years old. So you're not going to see changes very quickly in the number of adults, but we're seeing that there are fewer chicks. So that could produce fewer adults in the long run. And the, the acidification of the lakes, is that, is that increasing or is it stable? Like what, what were you able to determine in, in that uh, set of data that you gathered? Yeah, so uh, acid rain is kind of an interesting story because it was a real success story in terms of like government actions coming into place, noticing that acid rain was a problem and then um, putting regulations in place. So acid rain isn't really a problem in terms of its production, but the problem is that, so even though lake chemistry is improving, it just takes the biology a long time to recover. So how acid rain works is that it gets, uh, so basically fish are really sensitive to acid. And so they will be removed from any kind of lakes that are really acidic. And so then loons don't have anything to eat. And it's just that, um, even though the lake chemistry can improve, it doesn't mean that all of the fish populations can recover. So even 40 years after the initial study that was done that showed that lakes were really acidic and loons were doing really poorly, we're seeing that um, even though lake, lakes are becoming less acidic, it's just that the biology hasn't been able to catch up yet. So what do you think is the um, medium term future for uh for the populations of loons that you've been looking at is is climate change perhaps a factor that will cause further acidification like because generally as temperatures in, increase in a water body i think the uh, ability to absorb more of those uh acidif acidifying uh compounds occurs. I, I think that's my rudimentary understanding of chemistry. So um, do, do you think there's a link that someone else is obviously going to have to research, but that that climate change might undo a lot of the good work that's that's been done? Oh, poor <laughs> dear. <laughs> um. Yeah, so Coda's got a lot of opinions. Um, <laughs> Definitely, she's telling me you know, she's telling me to go back and work on my chemistry. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, climate change is a really interesting story. Like, so what some of my work showed is that there's probably a complex interplay between acid rain, and mercury, and climate change. So, um, so yeah, acid rain affects mercury um, because on more acidic lakes. Um, there's more mercury available to enter into the food chain and to make its way up into loons. And then um, what climate change does is that it's increasing mercury levels. So there was a really good study in Ontario that showed that um, warmer temperatures and other factors associated with climate change are increasing mercury levels in fish. And then it's also causing higher um, water level fluctuations, which increase mercury and um, make lakes more acidic. So it's a really complex kind of interplay with acid rain, mercury, and climate change that could be affecting loon reproductive success. So is the, um, is, merc is, is mercury the main chemical issue when it comes to acid rain, or are there other compounds that build up and affect the loons as well? Uh, yeah, so lead is also a big problem for loons um, because they'll, they're exposed to it from like fishing, tackle, and um, 
and just like lead shot, or I guess lead shot isn't so much of a problem for loons, but yeah, lead, lead poisoning is also a big problem for loons. Um, not so much related to climate change though. And what's the, the, the food for loons? I, I saw that they're a visual hunter <laughs> for getting their food, but um, I'm assuming they ate, they ate fish and frogs and other amphibians, but how broad is their diet? Did, were, were you analysing um, what, what they're eating in terms of the chemicals that they're ingesting? Yeah, unfortunately, we weren't able to look at mercury um, in fish and in loons directly, but we more so looked at um, the chemistry of the lake because there's a lot of work that was done previously that showed that on lakes that are more acidic, um, there are fewer fish. And there's also work um, linking um, yellow perch mercury. So yellow perch is the preferred food of loons. They'll eat a lot of stuff, but yellow perch are kind of the food that they love the most. And so there was research that linked yellow perch mercury to um, mercury levels in loon blood. That's pretty interesting that they have a, a main species that they prefer to eat. So they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty fussy. So uh, that sort of begs the question about how um, yellow perch numbers are holding up uh, in the face of climate change. Do you think there is any cause to con for concern there? Yeah. Um, so the loons will eat lots of other stuff. They can eat like other fish species and um, invertebrates and um, yeah, right. like you'd mentioned crabs and stuff. But I think there's um, there's some work showing that cold water species won't do as well um, because of climate change. And that could affect the, um, the types of fish that are accessible to loons. So the warm water adapted species might not be easy as easy for loons to catch or um, as nutritious for them. Okay. I'm really interested, Kristen, in that 40-year um, data set you were talking mm -hmm. about with um, citizen science data. Can you tell us a little bit about what that project is and what people actually are doing and who, who, who runs it and is it ongoing? Yeah, so the data set that I was working with, it's called the Canadian Lake Saloon Survey. So it started in Ontario in 1981 um, by Birds Canada and it's expanded throughout all of Canada um, since the 1990s. So it's the most popular citizen science program run by Birds Canada. And it's it's pretty cool. So it's just a lot of people in Ontario will visit lakes regularly or they live on lakes. And so they'll go out three times during the summer to the first time they'll look for loons and to see if they have chicks. And then they'll kind of monitor at, on the other two visits how old those chicks are and whether those chicks have survived. Um, to getting at least six weeks of age. And so it's a really cool data set um, that's been super valuable. There was, I analyzed data just in Ontario because the data went back to the 1980s. Um, I analyzed data from over 1500 lakes. And so yeah, there are over, um, I think it's 4,000 or 5,000 citizen scientists working on uh, these Canadian Lakes Loon Survey projects every year. And yeah, it's an ongoing and super popular project. That's pretty great. I mean, mm. I, I, I love the citizen science projects and uh, the bird counts around the world are really, uh, are really growing that, um, I mean, India run, run one as well as Canada, obviously uh, run their one. Uh, New Zealand have got a good one. And Australia have got one. Uh, I think I think Britain run a couple each year. I think they run uh, a couple of seasonal ones. Uh, how how important? And I want to sort of drag you in a, a bit about your uh, the role you've got now with uh, Environment Canada. Is it Environment Canada or is it just Department of the Environment? It's, they changed their name recently. It's Environment and Climate Change Canada. There we go. Well, good, yeah. good, good, good on them. That's a hot, that's some more work for the, the designers. Um, mm -hmm. how, how important uh, is it nowadays 
um, with so many restrictions and obviously tight budgets and everything, for ongoing citizen science projects for um, for people like yourself doing any kind of conservation work in in a government department. Oh, it's hugely important. So they it just makes it so that you have these massive data sets that um, scientists alone would never be able to collect. So by having like 1,500 lakes worth of data, that would be impossible for a research program to have enough funding to visit all of those lakes. Um, so it's really just like people being enthusiastic and collecting data about birds that they like to watch anyway and having all of this huge amount of data. Um, it, it really creates for really powerful analyses. And so, and, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering, Kristen, whether you tap into um, other data sets as well, like eBird and Merlin mm -hmm. and any others that, that are out there uh, to perhaps support uh, any hypothesis that you might be making or or any of the conclusions that you make from your own data set. How, how widely do you cast the net nowadays? Uh, it really depends on the question I'm asking. I have used, um, for the loon work, I actually used eBird data on bald eagles and double-crested cormorants because there's some concern about um, bald eagles depredating loons and um, eating their chicks. And so that can affect reproductive success. We found that that wasn't a problem in Ontario, but um, there are studies showing that it is a problem in other places. And we were looking at double-crested cormorants because there's a lot of concern about whether they deplete food or fish populations in the lakes that loons visit. So I was looking at eBird to kind of collect data on other species to see how they could be affecting loons. Um, yeah. so what what conclusions did you reach with your uh, with your learn work? Like we we've ascertained that you you found that the um, clutch size or that was it clutch size is is decreasing or successful um, successful rearing uh, was 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 decreasing. Let, let's get as accurate as we can. Sure. Yeah. So loons will usually only raise like maximum two chicks. So it's between one and two chicks. So we were just looking at reproductive success, um, which we measured as the number of six week old pair um, or loon chicks per pair per year. So it's the number of six week old chicks that each pair produces per year. That was what we were measuring. Okay. So it's, it, it's a little bit more general than the than the clutch size. Mm -hmm. It's really just looking at the overall the overall mortality or the overall success out of each each nest. So, did did you determine whether um, well, actually fill me fill me in on the habit of of the loon? Um, if there is 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 it a a big territory that loons? Uh, exclude other nesting loons from, or do, are they? Do they tolerate neighbours? Like how how does a breeding pair of of loons go about their their nesting business? Uh, they're very territorial. So as soon as the breeding season kicks in, the loons are there. They're uh, meeting with their mate, and then they're defending their territory. And they'll they'll defend their territory and get into these pretty intense battles with other loons that try to take their place. Um, so yeah, there, it depends on the size of the lake um, in terms of how many loons it can support. And it also depends on the shape of the lake. So if there are a lot of bays and different areas where loons can't make, um, can't see each other, then there can be more loon pairs. Um, but smaller lakes would probably only have one loon pair. Um, and that is just kind of a factor of food um, availability. And what did you determine with the bald eagles? Are they are they a major um, predator of of loon chicks or loon parents at all, or is that just sort of incidental predation? Actually, we found so in my work in Ontario, we found that on lakes where there were more eagles and more double-crested cormorants, there were more um, chicks being produced. 
So we think it's just a matter of all of these birds all eat fish. And so they're all attracted to lakes where there are a lot of fish. And so that's why we're seeing higher numbers of all three species um, on the same lakes. That's sort of counterintuitive in one, one sense, but it makes perfect sense uh, at the same time. So you, I know this wasn't really within the scope of your research, but be, because you're now at um, uh, Environment Canada and climate change, <laughs> uh, um, is uh, are lakes across Canada um, remaining healthy, like in terms of a, a good population of fish for predators as well as the fish themselves, of course. Uh, do you think the situation in Canada is is stable or is it getting better or are less lakes being those really healthy, um, multi-predator kind of uh, suitable habitats? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, our work was showing that lake health is probably declining. So the, the loons are a really good indicator of lake health because they're top predators and the loon chicks are really confined to the lake where they're born. Um, when they're, they're really small, they can't get food from any other lake. And so the amount of food that's in that one lake will determine, uh, will partially determine reproductive success. So if there isn't enough food, there's not enough fish in the lake, the loon chicks aren't going to survive. And so we found that there are fewer and fewer loon chicks being produced over time, which would suggest that something in the lake isn't healthy and that these loons, um, they're, they're, the lakes aren't able to support the loons. So will a, a nesting pair um, remain at this at the same lake all year or do the mature loons uh migrate or or are, are they just cruising around wherever they can find some uh some good food or are they are they a resident species uh no in so the the loons that are in canada in the summer they migrate to the ocean so they'll go farther south um in the summer or sorry in the winter so yeah, they're only here in the summer. So are there problems for the, the loon populations generally in how uh, those southern countries, which I'm guessing is going to be um, in the Canadian population, it's going to be the US and Mexico. Now, do, they, do they go further afield? Do they go out to the, uh, maybe to the, the Caribbean or... Uh, um, is there a Atlantic and a Pacific population? How, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I'm not super familiar with their migration, but I think the loons that are in Ontario will fly kind of to the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. And then the ones that are, are um, in kind of the Western part of Canada. So the Western provinces will go more to the Pacific and um, down near like California and then as far south as kind of that Pacific edge of Mexico. So the question I, I, I really wanted to get to there, uh, um, while, the, while the loons are breeding in Canada, um, there's a, a bunch of countries that are just caretakers for the birds at different uh, times of the year. So uh, do you know if the... Uh, if, if there's a sort of unusually high mortality, let's put it that way, uh, for birds that are um, spending the winter in in the US or even in uh, on the shores of Mexico, is there any indication that that each year less birds are returning? That's probably the best way to put it, isn't it? Uh, 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 I'm, you, and you know where I'm going, don't you? I'm just <laughs> trying to, I'm just trying to find out whether Canada seems to have really turned the corner in the way it manages its natural environment. But some countries haven't um, haven't got there yet. But they are major uh, in, influences on the population health of any any bird, any animal that uses that uh, that space. And of course, birds don't vote. So um, uh, what? 
what do you think? Is America a long... Uh, yeah, let, let me be controversial. Is America, <laughs> a, is America a long way behind Canada in the way they're looking after the environment for the loons, Kristen? <laughs> uh, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, yeah, I guess the, the loons... The thing is that they're hard to study on the ocean. They're hard to find. Um, I know that when they're in places like the Gulf of Mexico, they're, they can be affected by things like, like oil spills. So loons were really heavily um, impacted by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, for example. Um, there are a lot of loons that died because of that. Um, and yeah, in terms of other kind of um, things that loons are exposed to, it's, it's really a black box for loons. Um, it's hard to study them on the ocean. And so not a lot is known about them when they're spending their winter down south. Do they get hunted? Uh, I think, well, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Act, so they shouldn't be hunted, but I'm not sure what, um, if they if they are, um, and it's not recorded. I'm really interested to know, Kristen, what, what do you think is the best thing about the loon? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, they're, they're beautiful birds. They're super charismatic and their call is, um, yeah, like you said, it's very eerie and haunting and unique. Um, yeah, they're, I think they're just like a really cool bird. And from your work, um, what did, what did you realize still needs to be done? Like what's the next kind of, um, priority research from your opinion that needs to be carried out on loons? Well, um, so we looked at loons in Ontario and what could be driving decreases in their reproductive success. But the factors that we found that were involved, so that was pH and mercury and possibly climate change is involved there. Um, they might not be the same for every other region. So there are different threats to loons in different areas. So a really good future project. And I think um, a few of my co-authors are kind of setting up this project for someone else to work on would be to look at threats in different regions and to see what's affecting loons in the different kinds of areas that they visit. And how hard is it to get a project like that up? I mean, you're working in the government sector now, having uh, been in the university sector, yeah. So um, how difficult is it to get a, a study up that will last for long enough to get you enough data to be able to inform decisions in government? Let's talk about process rather than uh, any particular project. Um, well, getting the projects going is um, the, like the good thing about loons is that they're such good indicators and they have like a lot, a big following. People really love loons. And so there are already a lot of long term projects um, that have been going on for for a while. So there's work in Wisconsin and Minnesota looking at loons. Um, there's a lot of work in in Maine and in some of the other northern um, U.S. states. And then there's the Canadian loons or Canadian Lakes Loon Survey, which is all across Canada. And the good thing about the loon world is that it's pretty small. So everybody knows each other and it's a really great group that's good at collaborating. Um, so I think kind of piecing together all these long-term data sets um, is, is pretty doable for loons, thankfully. Is, how, how do you think that you can solve the problem of, of understanding what the birds are doing during the winter when they're in the uh, in the ocean. I mean, um, I, I'm, I mean, just the question that comes up for me is, uh, is is the loon population reducing just simply because of where they migrate to, because the risks there are so much higher, um, and that if um, if similar losses were felt um, for any reason in their breeding grounds, that it could very quickly become a, a really difficult problem for maintaining the population. Um, how, so 
how do you, how do you get citizen scientists to be working on the ocean? <laughs> uh, I mean, can 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 fishermen and um, I'm just trying to think who might see them. I mean, are people working in the oil industry and the fishing industry likely to see loons, or or do you know if when they're when they're in the uh, in their coastal um, portion of the year, whether they're just keeping as far away from people as they can. Um, that's a really good question. I'm not super familiar with loons and how easy they are to find um, on their wintering grounds. I think they they do come close to shore sometimes. And so um, I was actually just reading a book about loons that, uh, or someone talked about finding them in the winter, and they were successful at finding them. Um, but I, it really just depends, probably. I think uh, it would take uh, someone who's more familiar with kind of where they are and how they behave in the winter to answer that properly. So that, that kind of says that citizen science is not the answer to do, um, to do that kind of work. So then um, it just means it's hard, isn't it, to get a project yeah. like, like that up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I like to try and help people understand what um, researchers like yourself uh, do, Kristen. So um, when you're setting out like you were for what what, did, what was it, nine weeks in the field with, um, uh, with, with an assistant, mm -hmm. um, how much planning goes into that and... How, how does that Im impact sort of your, your normal life being away for, because um, it's not holidays, so you're still going to get hot vacation time and everything later in, uh, at some other point in the year, I assume. So how does being away for over two months um, at a time uh, impact your, I mean, what do you do with the dog? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think that a lot of people get into biology because they like doing that kind of stuff. So for me, it's like you're getting paid to do something you love. Um, so you're out, um, I don't know, camping for two months, looking for loons and going around in a canoe and driving on some crazy, like dangerous roads. And yeah, I thought it's a lot of fun. Um, but it, it does take a lot of planning to answer the first part of your question. It took about um, six months to kind of plan out what lakes we we're going to visit and how to get to these remote lakes and and all the supplies that we would need. So getting all the food for two months and uh, and and yeah, getting permits. And so, yeah, it takes a lot of planning. So there's a lot of legwork to get there. But once you're in the field, um, yeah, it, it was kind of a highlight of the loon work that I did, to be honest. Now, tell me, uh, I'm, uh, I usually ask a couple of um, standard questions about what what people take into the field and whatnot, but mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm going to assume that so many of the places that you were were visiting in that uh, couple of month period, you didn't have access every day to the internet. So, what's the process of of keeping the records how do you record the data and then how do you process it and as a follow-on to that what's the essential equipment that you take out on that kind of field field trip to to hang out with your loon buddies <laughs> uh well we record the data just on pen and paper and uh you have to be pretty organized to make sure that everything stays dry and uh and luckily we had a, a car, so we could put everything in the car. Um, and I guess in terms of essential equipment, um, yeah, well, we have to have like binoculars for looking for loons, uh, the canoe and the vehicle were pretty essential. Um, otherwise like our tent um, and, and like sleeping, camping supplies. Um, yeah, I guess it's anything that you would take on a camping trip is pretty much what we needed. Um, and in terms of the research, it was more like vials for holding water and binoculars were kind of our, our two main things. So, so you're not taking any sort of gadgets to do any um, 
data uploads or anything along the way um, or or maintaining a database along the way. It's all all pen and paper and then you um, you do all of the all of the input when you come back to back to the the lab the department mm -hmm. yeah we well there are places in our field work where we didn't even have radio so uh like tuning into the radio on the car so like there's no cell phone reception there's nothing out there um we did have a gps so we could if we got lost we could find our way but um yeah in terms of technology is very very basic and then yeah, you take all of those papers and enter them into an Excel sheet when you get home. So how good is it to be away, to be un totally unplugged like that? Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. Yeah, and uh, we listened to a lot of talk radio when we did have radio, so that was kind of our tune into the world when we wanted to. But otherwise, uh, it's really good to be unplugged. Wouldn't that be hugely depressing, listening to talk radio? I couldn't, <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine anything worse. Oh, Canada has a really good, well, at least I think it's good. We have a really good uh, CBC Radio 1, which is our kind of talk radio station. I really like it. So it, it, um, is is that one your, your Canadian broadcasting, um, uh, like public talk, mm -hmm. talk station? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that... I, I guess it's not so bad. I'm always thinking North America, North America. I'm l lumping you guys in with, with, with the other one. I mean, it, uh, we've got amazing um, ABC and the BB, BBC similar as well, New Zealand as well. With, um, uh, yeah, good, good talk shows. Because sometimes they even talk about the environment and 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 birds and things too. Mm, yeah. um, actually, let let's talk about that a bit. That. I mean, the reason I contacted you was because, hey, loons. Wow, loons. So when you were doing your your loon work and and writing it up, you mentioned to me um, before we went live that um, it was the most attention you'd ever got for any of you any of your field work. So tell me about loon celebrity. Um, who? <laughs> Who wanted to talk to you and what kind of things did, did people want to know uh, about your field work? I'm really interested to know what normal media want to talk about <laughs> with, with birds. Uh, well, I was actually interviewed by the CBC, which was kind of uh, a big deal for me since I'd listened to them all summer. Um, so that was good. I, and, and then a few like kind of nature magazines were interested in loons. Um, I think a lot of people just want to know um, a lot about their behavior, um, a lot about their calls. And then I think people are really concerned about loons because just anecdotally, you'd run into a lot of people who would tell you that like people really take possession of the loons on their lake. So those are their loons. They see them every summer. And a lot of people that we'd talk to would tell us that they were seeing, they weren't seeing as many chicks or maybe those loons weren't coming back. And so there's just a lot of people who are concerned about loons and yeah so there's a lot of interest in the work in terms of like what we're finding and and what could be going on with loons what what kind of things did they did they ask you that uh maybe surprised you like i'm i'm really interested in in how um the the mainstream media i mean those kind of uh, stations often don't have a really wide breadth of uh, of knowledge about their the environment the local environment um so what what kinds of questions did you did you get asked and did did you do you think there's a good understanding about loons in in general and and maybe um water birds in general the birds that use the lakes what tell yeah, just give us a bit of a, an idea of what it's like to to talk to, um, well, people like me who have got less interest in birds than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say, like, in terms of loons, I think most people know about them and are interested in them. So, in general, uh, a lot of the questions were pretty good. I think the worst question I had was um, when I was talking about how 
uh, lakes with fewer fish uh, don't have as high of reproductive success for loons. Um, I did get one question where someone was like, well, what's the solution? Do we just throw fish in a lake for loons? Is that how we deal with it? And uh, I don't know. It's just like, no, you can't just put fish in a lake. <laughs> that, well, that, that's kind of what I was expecting that you, yeah. you might get because um, uh, so often I'll, I'll hear discussions about any kind of conservation or environmental issue and and the presenters are often looking for the solution, mm -hmm. the solution, the easy solution. And um, it's never easy. There's always a, a number of factors, which I'm amazed at people who have spent 40 years or 30 years or 20 years in uh, interviewing people that they kind of don't, don't seem to get it. Anyway, mm -hmm. anyway, um, your role now, Kristen, what, what are you working on now? And let, let's have a look. What's your, what's your sort of five-year plan as a, as a scientist? Oh, good question. Um, I'm very new at my new job, I should say. I just started on Christmas Eve, actually. So I've only been at it a few months. Um, but I'm mostly working on um, kind of what I was doing with loons, but on different surveys. So um, looking at really large data sets um, for different bird species and looking at their populations and what could be driving any kind of population change. And what have you got target species in in mind? Um, well, right now I'm working on um, a sea duck paper, so um, scoter species. They're a sea duck that breeds in Canada, and I'm also working on a project with um, American woodcocks, which are um, a bird kind of in forested areas in Canada. Now, does the American woodcock, the one you're looking at, does that do the the, the jig? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, Wood, woodcocks are cool. Um, uh, that means I'm going to have to find a clip, aren't I, and, and put it in and show everyone. Um, uh, now, Scotter or Scoter? Scoter. Well, that's how Scoter. we pronounce them. Yeah. Okay, Scoter. Um, now, I, I know I know the surf Scoter. How many how many Scoters are you? Can you study in Canada? Uh, there are three scoters in Canada. So there's a uh, black, uh, white wing and surf scoter. And which one's the most common? I'm guessing it's the surf scoter. Uh, I'm not sure about numbers. I was more looking at their distribution. Um, so the white wing and surf scoters are widely distributed and the black scoters are kind of more separated, like on the Pacific and Atlantic coast. Um, but I'm not, I'm not really sure about their numbers. And, and that's kind of why we're studying scoters is that they're kind of not really well known. Okay, well, I've only ever seen pictures of, of scoters, obviously. So mm -hmm. um, what's cool about scoters? Um, well, yeah, I, I honestly don't know that much about them because I've kind of just started the work with them. Um, but they, they're kind of cool in that um, like, the work that I'm doing with them is pretty cool because they put satellite tags on scoters and then track them for several years. So you get to kind of see where these birds are going, which uh, people hadn't really known before. So that was pretty interesting. How, how long is that project going for and what, what did you discover up to up till now like where 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 are the tag birds going um well they're uh they're going pretty much like arctic canada and alaska um but it's just knowing um where they are relative to kind of the big surveys that take place in north america and and how that affects their monitoring um and yeah and just kind of the the known species ranges and then kind of extending those ranges into new areas now i I was talking about uh, penguins, uh, putting putting trackers on penguins with uh, with Ursula Allenberg recently, and uh, we we talked about the numbers of birds that need to be harnessed to to make a meaningful study. How many scoters got got a backpack? And and actually, was it the the harness type? of tracker that you were using or were you using the smaller ones that can be glued on to like a tail feather or something uh these ones were surgically implanted so they had a vet that would okay. implant yeah, yeah. them into the bird yeah okay so so they're the ones where you you have to 
you have to find the bird again is to read the data mm -hmm, i think so yeah 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 okay okay see there's so many ways to do <laughs> to do the the research nowadays mm -hmm. so um so just to finish off on on scotus do you know how many birds were implanted like what's the the size of that project I think it was close to 200. So we took all of the scoter data from all of North America and analyzed it. So, and it had been going on for basically since the satellite transmitters were available. So it was a pretty big data set. Cool. And um, that's, uh, it's, imagine if we had have had this kind of data and the cooperation cross-border research available um, in this manner in the last sort of 50, 50 years, we probably wouldn't have mucked it up so badly, would we? <laughs> yeah, and really like it is kind of a, a large scale problem because these migratory birds go everywhere. So it's not just like one country where they're affected, it's all over. That's one of the, the things that um, I, I'm not sure that people really, um, come to terms with when it comes to planning. I think it's a much, much like the same problem that I, I, I dumped on the, uh, on the mainstream media broadcasters. So I, I really don't think that politicians really understand how that, unless they're an endemic resident population, they're not your birds. They're everyone's birds, you know, that, and that we need to look after them everywhere they go. And the flyways um, cooperations tend to get it, but I'm still not sure that the, the broader migrations in general, I mean, just even thinking about the issue of bird strike, which, which I've done, you know, a number of interviews on, um, the idea that planning and building codes have something to do with conservation is it, it is foreign to a lot of decision makers. So tell me, with that long-winded sort of <laughs> preamble, tell me, Kristen, uh, do you think Canada is becoming more mature in its processes for decision making with conservation and environmental issues, and is it continuing to head in the right way? Or is there still a, a big divide between one sort of side of, of, of the aisle in Parliament or, and the other? Like, what's the situation? Well, um, from what I'm seeing, I think there's a lot of moves in the positive direction in terms of having these kind of joint venture projects where it's these huge collaborations between um, like flyways, uh, flyway kind of studies and, uh, and international studies. I think there's a lot of work really recognizing that birds don't really recognize borders. And so um, looking at birds kind of in South America and in Canada and in the US and knowing that they're affected at each stage of their migration and everywhere they visit, I think there's a real kind of broadening of the research that's being done. So that's all really good to see. That, well, that is really, really encouraging. Um, uh, let 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 let's sort of wrap it wrap it up on a on, on a really really happy note. Um, we we kind of I, I asked you about a five year plan. What um, do you see your long term future in in science, or do, do you have a a, a um, like have you got something you really want? you really want to do that you haven't been able to branch out into yet psycom more driving more citizen science where where do you see yourself heading oh honestly i really like what i'm doing right now um i i've already kind of branched out i started studying fish so uh i got into birds because i, I love doing it and i i really like analyzing bird data and uh and field work when i'm able to do it when there's no pandemic on so uh, yeah, I'm kind of doing what I, I like to do already. So if I can keep doing that for the next five years, that'd be great. So can we call you a bird nerd yet? Are you a, are you a certified bird nerd? 
Uh, I don't know if you can say that. I'm a terrible birder. I like I like birds and I appreciate them, but I'm terrible with bird ID. So I don't know if I fit into that category yet. Well, I'm, I think you can be a bird nerd while your ID skills are developing. Um, one of the uh, sort of thing, the bridges that you have to cross, I think, to become a certified bird nerd is, uh, are you keeping a list? I have in the past, uh, not so much now, because I am just kind of at home seeing house sparrows all the time. But uh, I do have a list. Well, I think that that means you that means you're a bird nerd. Right. Anyone who's <laughs> anyone who's kept a, a a list is a bird nerd. Um, uh, I th I think if you do more more bird projects, you're well and truly ensconced in in the bird world. As long as you don't go back and like study eels or or something like that and 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 then get distracted yeah um, tell me tell me about the 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 skoda project can that can people still contribute uh to that data set and and the loon data set is ongoing so where can people where can people who are in Canada and North America, and I'm guessing if they're seeing loons uh, further south, they can enter data. Where, where can people do that? Uh, well, for the loons, the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey, um, it's run by Birds Canada, and it's a really great citizen science program. So if anyone wants to look it up, um, it's on the Birds Canada website or just like Google Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. Um, and yeah, they're always looking for more volunteers, so you can help collect a lot of really good loon data. And can people still contribute to the SCOTA project? Uh, the SCOTA project wasn't a citizen science project. So that one um, is more just like researchers, uh, scientists doing their kind of thing. Okay. So, but if you're not a scientist, if you're a citizen scientist, you can still use eBird. So, oh go, yeah, that's true. Go, go, go ahead and go ahead and do that. Now, Birds Canada, I think, is birds.ca from memory. Is that that's right, isn't it? I think it's birdscanada.ca. Um, birdscanada.ca. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'll I'll get the link right in the description <laughs> since we've been talking about it. And your department in in government, Kristen, what are they doing in terms of outreach and are they running any citizen science projects on anything that people can be involved in? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think like the department that I'm in mostly takes other people's data and analyzes it, um, but we do a lot of work with the Breeding Birds Survey, which is... Um, a bird survey that's across North America. So they run bird surveys along roads, um, like roadside surveys, and they're done once a year. And it's uh, the longest running citizen science project in Canada. So that's also a really good way for people to get involved. And putting you on the spot, yeah. is that through the department that they would find that? Or would that be through um, Birds Canada again, or maybe through Audubon or? Um... That one, I think it's, I think it's through Canadian Wildlife Service, but I could be wrong. Um, but okay. if you just Google breeding bird survey, you definitely find it. I love the idea of a um, roadside uh, survey. I reckon that's something that we should get up and, and running in Australia because um, in, in a lot of cases, the only connectivity between uh, different populations and different remnant habitats is roads. So, um, yeah, I think mo understanding the movements and who's using those road reserves, I think, is uh, is pretty important. Well, Kristen, I reckon I reckon we've looned out, <laughs> totally looned out. Um, it's been it's been a, a, a different kind of discussion for the show because um, we weren't really talking about an endangered bird, but an indicator bird. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, and. I probably need to need to do that more and more often because there are data sets out there that can be used and uh, we can interpret all kinds of things from from that data. You know, tell me about the sparrows. Are sparrows um, 
uh, having issues in Canada? Uh, I know it's anecdotal. In when you look around, are you seeing sparrows decreasing in number or increasing or stable? It depends on the species. So house sparrows are um, invasive and they're doing great. Um, they're everywhere. Um, but the other sparrow species, um, I'm not super familiar with, but um, I'm, I think a lot of bird species aren't doing very well um, other than the invasives like the house sparrow. Yeah, it's a, I've told the story a lot of times. I'll just share it with you. One of the reasons that I, that I started doing um, the show was I was noticing that house sparrows and their uh, um, invasive species here mm. were actually reducing in number. Um, I, I was noticing it in, in my neighbourhood, but the thing that concerned me, apart from the fact that, gee, why are sparrows decreasing? But nothing was replacing them. So, so that just means there's less birds around. Mm. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can arrest that. Hey, oh, I hope to... so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, Kristen, thanks so much for joining me. Um, best wishes in your new job. That hopefully we'll hear and see some amazing work that you put out over the years to come. And hey, if you want to talk to me about any other bird stuff that you end up doing. Hit me up because I love talking. I love talking about birds. Yes, sounds great. <laughs> um, well, that's been the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. That's Kristen Bianchini. I got it right this time. Uh, we'll talk to you the next time. Thank you, everyone. Okay, now I'm just going to. So there we have it. That was uh, that was me learning about loons. Um, I'm pretty sure you noticed. Uh, I, I I was saving money. That was in the middle of the the lockdown period, and um, I I had to scale back on everything. And gee, the quality the quality of everything when I was going the free version of the streaming service was um, pretty ordinary. So. Sorry about that, but uh, that's that's just the way it is. Uh, Naomi, thank you for the love on Facebook. What are you doing watching me on a Sunday? I didn't think anyone from Australia would be watching me on a Sunday, particularly since it's such a stellar day out there. Um, magnificent. Now, folks, what I'm going to do is um, end this stream, break for a, for a little while, <clears throat> Um, I'll set up a new one and we'll do bird feeding. Uh, and the story there is, um, <laughs> I'm at a, I'm at a loss to, re to remember the name. I want to see, I want to say Leslie, but I think, I think Leslie, the bird nerd is someone that I follow on, on YouTube instead, but, um, who I'm speaking with in, in that interview has been writing a blog about her bird feeder and she's in, in the US for, I want to say 15 years. I'm pretty sure it's 15 years. So she's not podcasting or anything, but she is doing the blog. So we, we just talked about feeding birds in, in North America. And then later on, um, probably after dinner time, probably after early dinner time uh, here in Australia. So we'd be talking about probably five hours, six hours from now. I'll play the Ariape mannequin. And tomorrow, tomorrow midday, it's back to live. Uh, it doesn't mean that from tomorrow all the shows are going to be live. I still think we're, I still think we're going to have um, uh, maybe a week or two where it, Every other day, maybe more, it'll be recordings of older shows with me following along. Um, but tomorrow, Monday with Holly is back and Holly and I are talking about uh, what do birds do when summertime rolls around and 
hundred, uh, thousands or uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of humans invade their chosen habitat. And I've, uh, I hope Holly's going to be able to uh, make some uh, knowledgeable contribution about what birds do when something like this unbelievable flooding in the Kimberley region, the northwest region of Australia, which is now including towns like Broome and Derby or Derby, um, are flooded. It's 50 mile wide, the Fitzroy River has become. So obviously there's huge impacts on the people who live up there. But what about birds the size of a Gouldian finch or a grass wren or... And I'm thinking the pigeons can probably uh, travel a, a large distance, but things like crimson finches and um, even things like sister collars. I just wonder what happens to them, heath wrens. Um, so I'm, I've, I've, I've mailed Holly, but she's been on leave. She's not back till tomorrow. So I don't know whether we'll we'll be able to have a data-driven discussion about that or just a more general discussion. And I've reached out to some people who are in the NT um, to see whether they can speak to me. But uh, honestly, I'm guessing people have got far more, uh, lots of other things to worry about at the moment than to jump on a uh, jump on a live stream and, and, and talk about it. But, but we'll have to follow that up later on. Um, and I think what, I think what we'll do with, with Holly after Holly, uh, so Holly will be midday to maybe quarter past one. That's usually about the, the amount of time Holly's got available. I think when Holly leaves, I think I'll just keep the stream going and I'll, I'll replay something else, but I think I wouldn't mind having a discussion if, if you're here, um, to and fro, probably about the kinds of things that you would like to see as I build out the website that will make it useful. I, I mean, if you've been following me for, for a while, you probably know that I don't like doing things the way that everyone else does it just because that's what people do. And I, I look at the way people use the website, which pages they, they go to, you know, even though podcast data is generally pretty anonymous, uh, it gives me ideas with trends. I can tell you now, since I've started doing more on Facebook and, and, and now with um, TikTok, the uptake it seems to be better on those platforms now admittedly there's years of penetration going into the podcast um space but i didn't do much else uh i think i shared with you all before i was spending a lot of time writing grants uh, applications for grants applying for jobs chasing clients people who I thought might want to do streaming and whatnot for part of their business. And it was just such, it was such a waste of time. Uh, so now I'm just putting the time into really making, making use of all the work I've already done. I mean, God, there's 200, uh, 200 streams or something out there now, or, or combined with the early podcasts that were audio only. Uh, so there's piles of stuff out there. I mean, I, I just searched so many bird kind of topics and the first four, five, six things that come up in Google are always the bird emergency. Uh, so I've got to make the site more useful. The site's a, <laughs> what would Donald Trump have called it? A shithole, you know. It's, uh, so that's what I'm sort of spending time on. 
Um, so yeah, but but I'd like to be guided because obviously you're you're here, you're watching, you uh, into what I what I do. <laughs> Either that, or you're watching to make fun of me, which wouldn't be very nice. Um, and I want to. I mean, the idea for me has always been to highlight, showcase the work that other people are doing. So. Um, I'm sort of redesigning how each of the the page posts come up and I'll probably... I mean, are you interested in if I link to articles, uh, you know, journal articles that people have written and recently published um, that, that let you dig in deeper than, you know, a short article in The Guardian or in The Conversation or... You know those five paragraph things that they they put up on ABC, or um, I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I want to produce what people want. I don't want to spend th a, a thousand hours in the next couple of months writing long, detailed blog posts that people aren't uh, aren't interested in. If people only want audio and video, I'll keep I'll just keep pumping that out. Um, uh, oh, hi, Amy. Okay, so you good? You'd like links, Glenn? How are you, Glenn? Haven't haven't seen you for a while. Um, uh, but I think Glenn, you've been uh, you've been liking some of the um, first seen and herds, haven't you? That that I think I I think I I saw that. Um, okay, well, so what I'm going to work through? I was working on a format for the for like the guest or the author for each page but I don't like it so I'm going to scrap that so I'll I'll design a new pro forma to put maybe the um maybe the newest and maybe what I view as the most relevant article um that they've published and I'll I'll try to make them only articles that are um, public access because uh, so many of the, uh, I mean, so many of the journal articles are just, you just get it an abstract. And I'm, I understand why it happens, but I still don't like it. I think that if any of the research has been publicly funded, be it in, in whole or in part, it should be available for people like me to read and talk about and invite other people to, to learn about. So that's where we're going. Uh, yeah, Glenn, you, you have to remind me, where where are you seeing your birds? And I see I see a big camera there. Let's talk about that. Uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn, Naomi's joining me on Friday. Naomi will be in the stream when we replay... Actually, it's it's a an episode that has been out on the YouTube, and and I think I think you can grab it on Facebook, but it hasn't been in the pod feed yet um, with Sandy Horn, so that should be interesting. But tell me about that that camera rig you've got there, Glenn. Um, um, um my memory is pretty ordinary. Um, <laughs> I talk to so many people, I forget all the details so um uh are you are you up in uh actually it's difficult while i'm in the stream to actually chase up anything on facebook it uh eats up so much of the resources so just let me know what uh what part of the uh of the land you're in And do you have special interests? Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, Glenn. So, um, uh, so we've been, we've been, um, you're at the Mount Annan, um, gardens that you've been shooting and that's what we've been talking about, isn't it? Have I, have I got that right? Um, I get confused. Now, haven't we been? Have we been doing that on Twitter or on? We've been doing that on Twitter, haven't we? 
So not not via Facebook. Um, it's pretty hard to keep track of everything. Twitter, Mastodon. Oh, and tell me, Glenn, too, has Twitter almost lost its utility for you? Are you not seeing the people that you used to always want to see? You know, the... Um, I'm just not seeing most of the accounts that I used to love following on Twitter. So uh, I can be sure that if I'm not seeing them, I'm pretty sure that most of the stuff that I'm putting out on Twitter now isn't getting seen by the people who used to want to see me. And I'm getting I'm getting so much religious rubbish, crypto rubbish, um, pretty extreme political crap getting into my um uh into my feed but not people i follow people that twitter is forcing me to see and i'm i'm over it um so yeah um, cool um glenn we need to uh we need to talk about maybe getting you on one of the habitat gardening shows i think that would be that would be fab i really i really like um mount annan i reckon mount annan's a, a fab place um there's a lot of really good arboretums springing up in um in regional australia too now aren't there so um uh yeah ah oh, it's instagram we've been it's instagram okay Sorry, I just lose. I, and unless everyone uses exactly the same name, I can't. I, I can't tell who's who. I need to maybe make a make an air table or something so that I can keep track, and then I can follow up on things better. Um, but Glenn, um, uh, maybe can you can you Glenn DM me on on Instagram? Let me know the best place to email you, and we'll. We'll work out something about doing a uh, um, uh, getting you on habitat gardening and talking about um, let's let's talk about Man Annan for sure. Uh, I'm I'm right up for it. Um, yeah, that, that's a good strike, right? What are you, what are you missing? You've you've got 193 out of 163. <laughs> Do you have like a bogey bird down there, one that you'll always be talking to someone or go, oh, yeah, oh, I just saw that yesterday afternoon. Oh, it was down, <laughs> it was down there by the South Lawn. Oh. Uh, any of those? Hmm. I appreciate you checking out things on a Sunday. I I expected I'd just be talking to myself, but I figured there might be some people on the uh, in the Northern Hemisphere who might be um, watching today um canon r5 with the 800 um uh the 150 500 i think that was i think nico was talking about that in the sh in the show the other day but um the 800 uh does that weigh 1.5 kilo glenn i'm i'm interested in 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 how much you have to carry Naomi, I hope you're you're putting together a gear list for us for Friday. Um, oh no! Sorry to hear that, Glenn. You've you've got COVID. Um, take it easy. Um, yeah, take it easy. <laughs> yeah, Naomi, it's um, it's wild, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you um if if you guys noticed or seen any of the reviews that the Panasonic uh S five Mark II has come out and it's now got uh phase detection autofocus and apparently now Panasonic autofocus is really, really, really good. So so watch out. I'll have to do fundraising to get a, to get one. But I think um 
I haven't even looked at the specs. Actually, I might do that now. Um, see whether it'll it'll suit me. I've got to save up for the um, uh, for the four hundred mil uh, lens for the Panasonic. Um, S5. There we are. I don't even. I don't even want to look at the price for that. Oh gee, no, three grand. I think I'll be waiting a while for that. Uh, oh, it's full frame too, so that doesn't really work. I'll have to wait until the the next micro four thirds come out. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great, Naomi. Okay. Yeah, the the um <laughs> weighs a ton. Does that it it's not approaching two kilo, is it, Glenn? Um Yeah, the birds I detect. Um Yeah. I'm oh, I'm really hoping that maybe the next uh the next iteration of the um uh Yeah, Glenn, I, uh, the uh, the reason I chose the camera I did was because of the the video capability um, more than more than for the um, the stills, and I get the dual ibis with most of the um, with the Panasonics, so. Yeah, but yeah, as you you're right, they they um they fit and they and they work. Um, I won't be lashing out on on new on new lenses for for a while. There's more. There's other things I've got to invest in before I I grab some new lenses. Gee, I've got to get competent using the um uh the the GH five. <laughs> That's going to take me plenty of time. I'm starting a course too. Um, in a couple of weeks for the for the next six months, so that um, that's going to keep me uh, a bit uh, a bit busy. Yeah, yeah, Glenn, I, I chose the Panasonic just simply because it's smaller. Um, uh, it's smaller, everything's smaller, and you know I'm not doing professional work, so I don't I don't need to worry about that, and I doubt I'll ever be doing professional work. I just want to make nice clips for the uh, for the channel and have a kit that's small enough for me that I could take three cameras to do on-site interviews and 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 b-roll uh and and actually be able to carry it all myself um so that's that's really the the thinking there so um uh cool uh gee Glenn you you'll have to come on a show with with um uh, with Nicholas and and myself as well because we're yeah we've we've got some we've got some ideas going on there so um, yeah so please do DM me on uh, on Insta with an email for you and let's um, uh, let's talk I reckon you've got lots of things you could share to for the audience because the whole photography Friday thing is going to be you're always going to try and get total beginner, someone who's like uh, intermediate for want of a better a better term, but someone who is, you know, pretty handy with their camera, and and then someone who is, you know, working it professionally shooting either plants, animals, birds, and um, and travelling a lot, and you know. I think with that kind of panel each time, you get you get all the questions asked and answered. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. Well, what what are we at? It's it's one thirty here. I reckon we'll um, I'll I'll start up another stream at three o'clock uh, local time. So in ninety minutes, and that'll be that'll be the bird feeder, and then. Later 
in the uh, in the evening. Um, holy, holy moly! I've just seen that. Uh, 2.8 2.8 wow that uh that's that's amazing that is heavy that is heavy um fantastic thanks glenn that will be that will be great um yeah so if you if you're wanting to return for later on uh about 90 minutes time uh <laughs> thanks naomi <laughs> It's always nice to know someone. <laughs> I've got a friend on the stream. It's always cool. Uh, yeah, so about 90, 90 minutes time, we'll do the uh, bird. Um, the 15 years of feeding birds in the, in the US and then later on um, the Ariape mannequin. So it's all North America today. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>